Today is day four for the Come Follow Me study for this week, February 19th through the 25th. Oh, how great the plan of our God. 2 Nephi 6 through 10. Thursday, February 22nd, 2024. 2 Nephi 9, 15 through 27. The Judgment of the Holy One of Israel. 2 Nephi 9, 15. And it shall come to pass that when all men shall have passed from this first death unto life, insomuch as they have become immortal, they must appear before the judgment seat of the Holy One of Israel. Elder Bruce Conkey said, The reality is that there will be a whole hierarchy of judges who under Christ shall judge the righteous. He alone shall issue the decrees of damnation for the wicked. 2 Nephi 9.15 and then cometh the judgment, and then must they be judged according to the holy judgment of God. When Adam transgressed the commandment in the Garden of Eden and brought about the fall of man, two kinds of death were introduced into the world, physical death, which is the separation of the body and the spirit, and spiritual death, which is the separation or alienation from God, because both conditions come automatically upon all men through no act of their own. It is only just that they be taken care of without condition or price. Physical death is automatically overcome for all men by Christ through the resurrection, wherein the body and the spirit are reunited, never to be separated again. Something that is not so well understood, however, is that the resurrection also automatically brings all men back into the presence of God or overcomes the state of spiritual death caused by the fall of Adam. Thus, all the effects of the fall of Adam are overcome automatically without condition. In the cause of spiritual death, however, we must remember that our state of being separated from God in mortality is only partially due to Adam's transgression. We are born mortal, away from the presence of God, because of the fall. But once we become accountable and yield to temptation, we are responsible for our own state of uncleanness. In other words, we are then to blame for maintaining our state of alienation or spiritual death. If we will return to God and accept the sacrifice of his Son before the judgment, then we can be clothed with purity, yea, even with the rope of righteousness, through the redemptive power of the Savior. In other words, the spiritual death caused by our own fall will also be overcome in Christ, and we can dwell with God forever. But everyone will be brought back into God's presence. Everyone will have their state of spiritual death caused by Adam's fall temporarily overcome. For those who refuse to come unto Christ, their state of spiritual death or separation from God will be overcome only long enough to bring them into his presence for judgment. Then they will be banished from his glory and presence because of their refusal to repent. The idea that at the time of judgment we will have a perfect remembrance of our righteousness or our unrighteousness is also taught by Alma. Alma describes the awful shame that will grip all those who have not repented of their sins. 2 Nephi 9.16 And assuredly, as the Lord liveth, for the Lord God has spoken it, and it is his eternal word, which cannot pass away, that they who are righteous shall be righteous still, and those who are filthy shall be filthy still. Alma 34 That same spirit which doth possess your bodies at the time that ye go out of this life will have power to possess your body in that eternal world. Mormon 9 And because of the redemption of man, which came by Jesus Christ, they are brought back into the presence of the Lord. Yea, this is wherein all men are redeemed, because the death of Christ bringeth to pass the resurrection, which bringeth to pass the redemption from an endless sleep, from which sleep all men shall be awakened by the power of God, when the trump shall sound, and they shall come forth, both small and great, and all shall stand before his bar, being redeemed and loosed from this eternal band of death, which death is a temporal death. And then cometh the judgment of the Holy One upon them. And then cometh the time that he that is filthy shall be filthy still, and he that is righteous shall be righteous still. He that is happy shall be happy still, and he that is unhappy shall be unhappy still. Elder Dallin H. Oaks of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles spoke about the final judgment and the condition of cleanliness we must achieve. Many Bible and modern scriptures speak of a final judgment at which all persons will be rewarded according to their deeds and works or the desires of their hearts. But other scriptures enlarge upon this by referring to our being judged by the condition we have achieved. The prophet Nephi described the final judgment in terms of what we have become. And if their works have been filthiness, they must needs be filthy. And if they be filthy, it must needs be that they cannot dwell in the kingdom of God.
Moroni declares, He that is filthy shall be filthy still, and he that is righteous shall be righteous still. The same would be true of selfish or disobedient or any other personal attribute inconsistent with the requirements of God. Referring to the state of the wicked in the final judgment, Alma explains that if we are condemned by our words, our works, and our thoughts, we shall not be found spotless, and in this awful state we shall not dare to look up to our God. Doctrine and Covenants 88 And he who cannot abide the law of a telestial kingdom cannot abide a telestial law. Doctrine and Covenants 88 And he who cannot abide the law of a telestial kingdom cannot abide a telestial glory. Therefore he is not met for a kingdom of glory. Therefore he must abide a kingdom which is not a kingdom of glory. That which breaketh the law and abideth not by law, but seeketh to become a law unto itself, and willeth to abide in sin, and altogether abideth in sin, cannot be sanctified by law, neither by mercy, justice, or judgment. Therefore they must remain filthy still. And another trump shall sound, which is the fourth trump, saying, There are found among those who are to remain the sons of perdition, until that great and last day, even the end, who shall remain filthy still. Second Nephi 9.16 Wherefore they who are filthy are the devil and his angels, and they shall go away into everlasting fire, prepared for them, and their torment is as a lake of fire and brimstone, whose flame ascendeth up forever and ever, and has no end. Mosiah 2 Therefore if that man repenteth not, and remaineth and dieth an enemy to God, the demands of divine justice do awaken his immortal soul to a lively sense of his own guilt, which doth cause him to shrink from the presence of the Lord, and doth fill his breast with guilt and pain and anguish, which is like an unquenchable fire, whose flame ascendeth up forever and ever. The prophet Joseph Smith said, A man is his own tormentor and his own condemner. Hence the saying, They shall go into the lake that burns with fire and brimstone. The torment of disappointment in the mind of man is as exquisite as a lake burning with fire and brimstone. I say, so is the torment of man. Why will the judgment be perfectly just? Where is the evidence gathered from by which we will be judged? Second Nephi 9.17 O oh, the greatness and the justice of our God! The prophet Joseph Smith said, Without the idea of the existence of the attribute justice in the deity, men could not have confidence sufficiently to place themselves under his guidance and direction, for they would be filled with fear and doubt, lest the judge of all the earth would not do right, and thus fear or doubt existing in the mind would preclude the possibility of the exercise of faith in him for life and salvation. Second Nephi 9.17 For he executeth all his words, and they have gone forth out of his mouth, and his law must be fulfilled. Doctrine and Covenants 1 What I the Lord have spoken, I have spoken, and I excuse not myself, and though the heavens and the earth pass away, my word shall not pass away. But shall all be fulfilled, whether by mine own voice or by the voice of my servants, it is the same. Doctrine Covenants 82 I, the Lord, am bound when ye do what I say, but when ye do not what I say, ye have no promise. Second Nephi 9, 18 But behold the righteous, the saints of the Holy One of Israel, they who have believed in the Holy One of Israel, they who have endured the crosses of the world. Joseph Smith's translation, Matthew 16 then said Jesus unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself, and take up his cross, and follow me. And now for a man to take up his cross is to deny himself of all ungodliness, and every worldly lust, and keep my commandments. Elder Neil A. Maxwell of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles suggested a meaning for the word crosses. What are the crosses of the world? We cannot be sure, but the imagery suggests the bearing of a cross placed upon us by the world, as Jesus did. There may be persecutors and unhelpful onlookers, and the church member is set apart, if not set upon. Yet he does not flinch when accused and scoffed at by those who would make him ashamed, for he has no real reason to be ashamed. Second Nephi 9.18 And despise the shame of it, they shall inherit the kingdom of God, which was prepared for them from the foundation of the world, and their joy shall be full forever. President Russell M. Nelson said, If we look to the world and follow its formulas for happiness, we will never know joy. The unrighteous may experience any number of emotions and sensations, but they will never experience joy. Joy is a gift for the faithful. 
It is the gift that comes from intentionally trying to live a righteous life, as taught by Jesus Christ. 2 Nephi 9, 19. O oh, the greatness of the mercy of our God, the Holy One of Israel, for he delivereth his saints from that awful monster, the devil, and death and hell, and that lake of fire and brimstone, which is endless torment. God knows all things. Your children are likely to interact with people, if they haven't already, who think that the Lord's commandments are foolish or out of date. Maybe you and your children could talk about how to explain why they're happy to keep the commandments. Why is it important to trust God's counsel, even if we do not completely understand it? You could encourage them to look in 2 Nephi 9, 20, 28-29, 42 43 for help with thinking about and discussing these questions. 2 Nephi 9, 20. Oh, how great the holiness of our God. As one reads 2 Nephi 9, one notices the interesting way that Jacob approaches each of his subjects, always in terms of God's goodness and greatness. For instance, verse 8 begins, Oh, the wisdom of God, his mercy and grace. Verse 10 begins, Oh, how great the goodness of our God. Look also at verses 13, 17, 19, and 20. Each item Jacob mentions is an attribute of God. God is full of wisdom, goodness, justice, mercy, and holiness. The prophet Joseph Smith has said, By a little reflection it will be seen that the idea of the existence of these attributes in the deity is necessary to enable any rational being to exercise faith in him. For without the idea of the existence of these attributes in the deity, men could not exercise faith in him for life and salvation, seeing that without the knowledge of all things, God would not be able to save any portion of his creatures, for it is by reason of the knowledge which he has of all things, from the beginning to the end, that enables him to give that understanding to his creatures, by which they are made partakers of eternal life. And if it were not for the idea existing in the minds of men that God had all knowledge, it would be impossible for them to exercise faith in him. Jacob was so awed by God's plan of redemption that he exclaimed, Oh, how great the plan of our God! Look for his exclamations in 2 Nephi 9. Most of them are found in verses 8 through 20. What do you learn from these verses about God's plan? What experiences have helped you feel more of what Jacob felt? Two brothers, Jimmy, age 14, and John, age 19, though that's not their real names, without safety ropes or harnesses or climbing gear of any kind, attempted to scale a sheer canyon wall in my native southern Utah. You know, I think this is what Mom was talking about. And she said not to do anything stupid. Well, I'm not going to tell her. And neither are you, right? Well, no, but if you fall and die, I, I'm just saying I told you so now, so I don't have to say it then. <laughs> Look, we're not gonna die, okay? Now stop talking and start climbing. Near the top of their laborious climb, they discovered that a protruding ledge denied them their final few feet of ascent. They could not get over it, but neither could they now retreat from it. They were stranded. I'm gonna stand here, and I need you to step on my knee and then on my shoulders, and I'm gonna boost you up, okay? I won't make it, that's not gonna work. Look, it has to work, all right? Come on. Good, now my shoulders. There you go, right there. One more. After careful maneuvering, John found enough footing to boost his younger brother to safety on the top of the ledge. But there was no way to lift himself. Okay, I made it. Now it's your turn, we gotta get you up here. There's gotta be another way. There's no other way up. I gotta go over the top. Here we go, find a tree branch that's strong enough 
to hold me and pull me up. I can hold on. No, I'm not going to leave you. Just go. I can hold on. Unable to hold on much longer, John decided his only option was to try to jump vertically in an effort to grab the top of the overhanging ledge. Jimmy! If successful, he might, by his considerable arm strength, pull himself to safety. In his own words, he said, giving him enough time to be out of sight, I said my last prayer. Heavenly Father, I'm so sorry. Please, please, bless my family and help them know that I love them so much. And please, please, bless Jimmy that he'll find a way to make it home safely. Then I left. Suddenly, two hands shot out, grabbing my wrists with a strength and a determination that belied their size. My faithful little brother had not gone looking for any fictitious tree branch. Guessing exactly what I was planning to do, he had never moved an inch. He had simply waited, silently, almost breathlessly, knowing full well I would be foolish enough to try to make that jump. When I did, he grabbed me. He held me. And he refused to let me fall. Those strong brotherly arms saved my life that day as I dangled helplessly above what surely would have been certain death. Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, suffered, died, and rose from death in order that he could, like lightning in a summer storm, grasp us as we fall, hold us with his might, and through our obedience to his commandments, lift us to eternal life. As part of your worship and study, consider looking for a hymn that might express how you feel about him, such as How Great Thou Art.
2 Nephi 9.20 For he knoweth all things, and there is not anything, save he knows it. What do the scriptures teach about the omniscience, infinite and complete knowledge of God? Alma 26 Now have we not reason to rejoice? Yea, I say unto you, there never were men that had so great reason to rejoice as we, since the world began. Yea, and my joy is carried away, even unto boasting in my God, for he has all power, all wisdom, and all understanding. He comprehendeth all things, and he is a merciful being, even unto salvation, to those who will repent and believe on his name. Doctrine and Covenants 38 Thus saith the Lord your God, even Jesus Christ, the great I Am, Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the same which looked upon the wide expanse of eternity, and, and all the seraphic hosts of heaven before the world was made, the same which knoweth all things, for all things are present before mine eyes. Elder Neil A. Maxwell explained that God must know all things in order to accomplish his work of bringing to pass our immortality and eternal life. Those who try to qualify God's omniscience fail to understand that he has no need to avoid ennui or tedium by learning new things. Because God's love is also perfect, there is, in fact, divine delight in that one eternal round, which to us seems to be all routine and repetition. God derives his great and continuing joy and glory by increasing and advancing his creatures and not from new intellectual experiences. There is a vast difference, therefore, between an omniscient God and the false notion that God is on some sort of postdoctoral fellowship, still searching for additional key truths and vital data. Were the latter so, God might at any moment discover some new truth not previously known to him that would restructure, diminish, or undercut certain truths previously known by him. Prophecy would be mere prediction. Planning assumptions pertaining to our redemption would need to be revised. Fortunately for us, however, his plan of salvation is constantly underway, not constantly under revision. In a very real sense, all we need to know is that God knows all. Hiram Smith, the patriarch, taught simply, Our Savior is competent to save all from death and hell. I can prove it out of the revelation. I would not serve a God that had not all wisdom and all power. President Joseph Fielding Smith observed, Do we believe that God has all wisdom? If so, in that he is absolute. If there is something he does not know, then he is not absolute in wisdom. And to think such a thing is absurd. Does he have all power? If so, then there is nothing in which he lacks. If he is lacking in wisdom and in power, then he is not supreme, and there must be something greater than he is, and this is absurd. He also said, I believe that God knows all things, and that his understanding is perfect, not relative. I have not seen or heard of any revealed fact to the contrary. I believe that our Heavenly Father and His Son Jesus Christ are perfect. I offer no excuse for the simplicity of my faith. Joseph Smith described our father's progression in the King Follett sermon, speaking as Christ might speak. The prophet said, I do the things I saw my father do when worlds came rolling into existence. My father worked out his kingdom with fear and trembling, and I must do the same. And when I get my kingdom, I shall present it to my father, so that he may obtain kingdom upon kingdom, and it will exalt him in glory. He will then take a higher exaltation, and I will take his place, and thereby become exalted myself. The prophet therefore concluded, so that Jesus treads in the tracks of his father and inherits what God did before, and God is thus glorified and exalted in the salvation and exaltation of all his children. The idea that God progresses in any manner other than through the exaltation of his children is without scriptural support. Christ suffered the pain of all men. Consider using 2 Nephi 9, 21-22 to talk with your children about why you are grateful for Jesus Christ. Second Nephi 9, 21 And he cometh into the world that he may save all men. Doctrine and Covenant 76 And this is the gospel, the glad tidings, which the voice out of the heavens bore record unto us, that he came into the world, even Jesus, to be crucified for the world, and to bear the sins of the world, and to sanctify the world, and to cleanse it from all unrighteousness, that through him all might be saved, whom the Father had put into his power, and made by him. 
who glorifies the Father and saves all the works of his hands, except those sons of perdition who deny the Son after the Father has revealed him. Second Nephi 9.21 If they will hearken unto his voice. Article of Faith 1.3 we believe that through the atonement of Christ, all mankind may be saved by obedience to the laws and ordinances of the gospel. 2 Nephi 9.21 For behold, he suffered the pains of all men, yea, the pains of every living creature, both men, women, and children, who belong to the family of Adam. Doctrine and Covenants 18 Remember the worth of souls is great in the sight of God. For behold, the Lord your Redeemer suffereth death in the flesh. Wherefore, he suffereth the pain of all men, that all men might repent and come unto him, and he hath risen again from the dead, that he might bring all men unto him on conditions of repentance. And how great is his joy in the soul that repenteth! Wherefore, you are called to cry repentance unto this people. Elder James E. Talmadge said, Christ's agony in the garden is unfathomable by the infinite mind, both as to intensity and cause. The thought that he suffered through fear of death is untenable, Death to him was preliminary to resurrection and triumphal return to the Father from whom he had come and to a state of glory, even beyond what he had before possessed, and moreover, it was within his power to lay down his life voluntarily. He struggled and groaned under a burden, such as no other being who has lived on earth might even conceive as possible. It was not physical pain or mental anguish alone that caused him to suffer such torture as to produce an exclusion of blood from every pore, but a spiritual agony of soul, such as only God was capable of experiencing. No other man, however great his powers of physical or mental endurance, could have suffered so, for his human organism would have succumbed, and succumb would have produced unconsciousness and welcome oblivion. In that hour of anguish, Christ met and overcame all the horrors that Satan, the prince of this world, could inflict. The frightful struggle incident to the temptations immediately following the Lord's baptism was surpassed and overshadowed by his supreme contest with the powers of evil. In some manner, actual and terribly real, though to man incomprehensible, the Savior took upon himself the burden of the sins of mankind from Adam to the end of the world. Modern revelation assists us to a particular understanding of the awful experience. In March 1830, the glorified Lord Jesus Christ thus spoke, for behold, I, God, have suffered these things for all, that they might not suffer if they would repent. But if they would not repent, they must suffer even as I. Which suffering caused myself, even God, the greatest of all, to tremble because of pain, and to bleed at every pore, and to suffer both body and spirit. And would that I might not drink the bitter cup and shrink. Nevertheless, glory be to the Father, and I partook, and finished my preparations unto the children of men. From the terrible conflict in Gethsemane, Christ emerged a victor. Though in the dark tribulation of that fearful hour he had pleaded that the bitter cup be removed from his lips, the request, however oft repeated, was always conditional. The accomplishment of the Father's will was never lost sight of as the object of the Son's supreme desire. The further tragedy of the night and the cruel inflictions that awaited him on the morrow to culminate in the frightful tortures of the cross would not exceed the bitter anguish through which he had successfully passed. 2 Nephi 9.22 And he suffered this, that the resurrection might pass upon all men, that all might stand before him at the great and dreadful day. Helaman 14 For behold, Christ surely must die, that salvation may come. Yea, it behooveth him, and becometh expedient that he dieth, to bring to pass the resurrection of the dead, that thereby men may be brought into the presence of the Lord. 2 Nephi 9.23 And he commandeth all men, that they must repent and be baptized in his name having perfect faith in the Holy One of Israel, or they cannot be saved in the kingdom of God. President Joseph Fielding Smith has written, The Book of Mormon teaches us that baptism for the remission of sins was a fundamental principle of the gospel among the Nephites from the time of Lehi all through his, their history. All through the Book of Mormon there are references to baptism as an ordinance for the remission of sins. What their word for baptism was is not revealed, but in the translation the prophet Joseph Smith used the familiar expression of our time. 2 Nephi 9.24 And if they will not repent, and believe in his name, and be baptized in his name, and endure to the end, they must be damned. For the Lord God, the Holy One of Israel, has spoken it. President Brigham Young spoke of the extent of the Savior's efforts to save mankind. 
This is the plan of salvation. Jesus will never cease his work until all are brought up to the enjoyment of a kingdom in the mansions of his Father, where there are many kingdoms and many glories to suit the works and faithfulness of all men that have lived on the earth. Some will obey the celestial law and receive of its glory. Some will abide the terrestrial and some the telestial. Consider inviting your children to share their feelings about Jesus Christ. A song like I Feel My Savior's Love could help. Jacob teaches the law of justification, 2 Nephi 9, 25-26. Wherefore, he was given a law, and where there is no law given, there is no punishment. And where there is no punishment, there is no condemnation. And where there is no condemnation, the mercies of the Holy One of Israel have claim upon him because of the atonement, for they are delivered by the power of him. For the atonement satisfies the demands of his justice upon all those who have not the law given to them that they are delivered from that awful monster, death and hell, and the devil, and the lake of fire and brimstone, which is endless torment. Elder James E. Talmadge of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles explained the role of knowledge in our accountability. According to the technical definition of sin, it consists in the violation of law, and in this strict sense, sin may be committed inadvertently or in ignorance. It is plain, however, from the scriptural doctrine of human responsibility and the unerring justice of God, that in his transgressions, as in his righteous deeds, man might be judged according to his ability to comprehend and obey law. To him who has never been made acquainted with a higher law, the requirements of that law do not apply in their fullness. 
For sins committed without knowledge, that is, for laws committed in ignorance, a propitiation has been provided in the atonement wrought through the sacrifice of the Savior, and sinners of this class do not stand condemned, but shall be given opportunity yet to learn and to accept or reject the principles of the gospel. President Boyd K. Packer, President of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, clarified the position of those who do not have knowledge of God's laws. Provision is made in the plan for those who live in mortality, without knowing the plan. Without the sacred work of the redemption of the dead, the plan would be incomplete and would really be unfair. Elder Jeffrey R. Holland described some of those who do not have the gospel law. In the broad reach of the atonement, generous provision is made for those who die without a knowledge of the gospel or the opportunity to embrace it, including children under the age of accountability, the mentally impaired, those who have never come in contact with the gospel, and so forth. 2 Nephi 9.26, and they are restored to that God who gave them breath, which is the Holy One of Israel. Elder Bruce R. McConkie said, when it came to placing man on earth, there was a change in creators. That is, the Father himself became personally involved. All things were created by the Son, using the power delegated by the Father, except man. In the Spirit and again in the flesh, man was created by the Father. There was no delegation of authority where the crowning creature of creation was concerned. Based on what you read, how would you explain why we need the atonement of Jesus Christ? What did you find that inspires you to praise the wisdom of God, His mercy and grace? In addition to teaching what Jesus Christ saved us from, Jacob also gave insights about how he did it. Consider recording what you found in 2 Nephi 9, 11-15, and 20-24. It should be remembered that all who reach the age of accountability are given the light of Christ. This allows a man to have at least a foundation of knowing what is good and what is evil. Therefore, all who have reached the age of accountability are not without responsibility, even though the accountability is obviously not the same as one who has been taught the principles of the gospel. For him and to whom much is given, much is required, and he who sins against the greater light shall receive the greater condemnation. The atonement of Jesus Christ covers all who transgress in ignorance. 2 Nephi 9.27 But woe unto him that has the law given, yea, that has all the commandments of God, like unto us, and that transgresseth them. Mosiah 15, But behold, and fear, and tremble before God, for ye ought to tremble, for the Lord redeemeth none such that rebel against him, and die in their sins, yea, even all those that have perished in their sins, ever since the world began, that have unwillfully rebelled against God, that have known the commandments of God, and would not keep them, these are they that have no part in the first resurrection. Therefore ought ye not to tremble? For salvation cometh to none such. For the Lord hath redeemed none such. Yea, neither can the Lord redeem such, for he cannot deny himself, for he cannot deny justice when it has its claim. Second Nephi 9.27 And that wasteth the days of his probation, for awful is his state. In the words of Amulek, Alma 34, I beseech of you that ye do not procrastinate the day of your repentance until the end, for after this day of life, which is given us to prepare for eternity. Behold, if we do not improve our time while in this life, then cometh the night of darkness, wherein there can be no labor performed. 